It was the fall of 2018 when I purchased a flipper house. I don't mean the dolphin. I mean a house that was ugly, it was beat up, and it was so bad that everything on the inside had to be redone. All of the paint, all of the floors had to be ripped out, the bathrooms were, were torn down to the studs. But the biggest issue that I faced was the back deck. See, the back deck was, it was, it was large and it was kind of falling apart. And after a certain height, I think it's like 10 feet, if you, if you want to do it, like have a contractor do it, then they have to get an architect and a permit and all this other stuff. And at that time, it would have been like 35000 to have it redone. Now that would be, you know, 50000 or whatever it might be. But I didn't have the money for that. And so I decided that, you know, as a home improvement guy, I'll try to do the, the deck myself. But I don't have enough skill, so I called upon a friend of mine who is a good carpenter, also happens to be a worship leader. <laughs> and we went out there, and he kind of laid it out for me. Here's what you need to do. And so what we did was we, we left the main posts of the deck there and the rim joists on the outside. And so that was kind of the structure. We tore everything else out, and then, and then I rebuilt it based upon that frame. And so there I was, you know, uh, suddenly becoming a deck builder. Well, what I discovered is I was trying to put this thing together that I've got my tools, I'm out there measuring and cutting and measuring and cutting. And you know how they say you measure twice and you cut once, or is it you measure once and you cut twice? I don't know. But I was doing it the right way, and I'm bringing you know, pieces of wood in, and, and nothing's lining up. And the reason is that, you know, after looking at the structure that we had left, just the posts and these rim joists, that everything was out of square, everything w wasn't plumb. And so you're, you're trying to build something off of a base that is totally whacked out and that is totally messed up. And so it's really hard. So, you, you know, you, you, uh, you get the deck boards on and you have this railing, but the, the main posts aren't plumb. And so you're, you're moving this railing along, but you realize that if you actually make it square, it's going to look funny. So then you have to cheat and you spend all this time trying to get this deck to work and not look ridiculous because the foundation, the core was, was not plumb. It was not square. Now, as I consider this story, it reminded me of our spiritual lives, that if at our core, at our foundation, if we are not calibrated with the Lord, if we are not in sync with the Lord, if we are not plumb with the Lord, if we are not square with Him, then everything that we do kind of ripples away from that. So we have got to get our lives, our spiritual lives, what we believe and what we think in sync, in square with the Lord, and then from there we can proceed. So this morning, our title is Creed Calibration, that we want to calibrate, recalibrate what we think, what we believe, and what we do, and that we ought to be open to a certain level of spiritual correction. So if you would, turn with me to Luke 24, and we're going to be reading verses 13 to 35. Now, when we last met, Luke described for us an event that we might simply call Easter Sunday. The tomb was empty. The angel declared to the women that Jesus was risen. The women then ran and reported that information to the apostles who didn't really believe them, but then they ended up investigating it anyway. And thus far in the book of Luke, all we have seen is an empty tomb. There's been no sighting of a, ri a risen Savior just yet. And that's going to change today as we begin with Luke 24, starting with verse 13. This is from the ESV. This is what the scripture says. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Things happened. 
Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they'd even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now spent. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, that is our story today from Luke 24. And we have to begin our narrative, unfortunately, with an odd choice that was made by the ESV translation. If you look at the beginning of the sentence in verse 13, the ESV says, that very day, two of them. If we consider the NIV and the Holman Christian Standard, it says, now, that same day, two of them. Not a big deal. But then we can compare that with, say, the King James, the New King James, and the NASB 95. There's a different story. It adds in another line. It says, and behold, two of them, or now behold, two of them. So what's happening here? Why, why did the ESV not include this? And I, frankly, I have no idea, but I know the NASB and the King Jimmy wins the award for the day. You see, the Greek is rather simple. On the bottom left on the screen, it says, Kai idu, and that just means and or now, behold. Why is this relevant? Well, the Son of God, the Messiah, literally just walked out of his tomb after being dead for three days, and Luke often uses this specific construction when he writes, Kai Adu, to introduce something new and unexpected. This is way, his way of saying, now behold, or check it out, look what's about to happen. So if this were a movie scene, if this were a movie, the last scene would have been Peter, he's in the tomb, he's poking around looking around, what's going on? He's utterly amazed, and then it fades out, and then it fades, and the music shifts, and now there's this dusty road, and you see two guys walking down the road, and this is way, this is Luke's way of saying, and behold, something important, something incredible is about to happen. The two followers of Jesus were walking down the road to a little village called Emmaus, Now, this village is seven miles outside of Jerusalem. Its current location has been lost to history, but the name means hot baths. So we might guess that there was was a hot spring there at some point. It's Sunday, probably afternoon, and these men were in Jerusalem. They're probably walking back to their homes. And so they're making their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus, the seven-mile walk. And as they walked, they were doing what you would expect them to do. They were decompressing over the events of the weekend. You see, Jesus had been arrested, he was crucified, and he was buried. And so they're walking along the road, and they're decompressing. They're talking back and forth. Yeah, well, I thought this. And did you notice that so-and-so said that? They're going back and forth about what they saw and what they experienced. But something, something unexpected happens. And this is where we get our behold They're walking down the road, and suddenly there's another guy on the road who joins them. And this is normal to travel in packs with like-minded people. It's better safety in numbers. So these men are, are talking, and another guy comes up and joins them. But what we find is that the two men didn't recognize who he was. They were afflicted with a type of spiritual blindness. Now look, verse 16 It says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, please note, 
This is not a failure on the part of these men. This, this is not these men, you know, being unobservant or being witless. No, no. Luke tells us that they were kept from recognizing him. Someone or something rendered these men unable to discern who Jesus was. Now notice the passive voice here in this sentence. As typical in a passive voice, it doesn't include the subject of the verb. So who was it or what was it that kept them from recognizing Jesus? Well, it doesn't say, but we can rightly assume that it was some sort of spiritual activity that was, it was the Lord himself. Jesus had a reason for veiling himself He wasn't ready to be recognized. But what we do read in verses 17 to 18 is that Jesus then engages them. So they're walking along. They're talking about the events of the weekend. He shows up, walks with them. They don't recognize who he is. And in our vernacular, he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? Now, after that question, I imagine them kind of stopping and their countenance dropped. It dropped with sadness. Now, we are told that one of the men's name was Cleopas. And by the way, his name is never mentioned again in Scripture. This is all we know about him is just this encounter. But Jesus feigns ignorance about the events of the weekend. He's like, what what, what are you guys talking about? What happened? And they're kind of put out, like, really? You were in Jerusalem and you don't know what happened? This Jesus character was crucified and died? So they explain to him what we might call prevailing information. They say to him, yeah, this Jesus guy, he was, he was a, a prophet. He was mighty in the word, mighty in the deed, and indeed, but the religious leaders executed him. And then Cleopas goes on to say that he, like many, was hoping that this Jesus character would redeem Israel, but Jesus is dead and he's been dead for three days. The dream is over. There are two things I want to mention about Jesus' time in the grave. And the first is, we might ask, well, why would Jesus stay in the grave for three days? Someone might say, well, he kind of had to because Hosea, the prophet, mentioned something about being in the grave for three days. And Jesus himself said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Okay, I get it. But originally, why was the plan for Jesus to be in the grave for three days? You see, there was a common belief that if a person died, the spirit remained nearby for three days. And after that, the spirit would fully depart. And so if Jesus came back to life sooner, there might have been some question about the legitimacy of his actual death. And in fact, we even see this view coming out in what Cleopas said. If you look at verse 21, he says, We had hoped that he he was the one to redeem Israel, Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. In Cleopas' mind, since three days had passed, there was no hope of Jesus returning. The three days assured the masses that he didn't swoon, that he wasn't uh, in some sort of coma or anything like that. He was truly dead. But before three days... People thought, well, maybe he was only mostly dead. And if you're mostly dead, then you're slightly alive. Inconceivable. The second partially off-topic comment is what some might refer to as a contradiction. You see, critics of the gospel like to point out that Jesus was not in the grave for three days, and thus his statements and the prophecies were false. You see, Jesus died on Friday and came back to life Sunday morning, let's just say at 6 a.m., and that's only about 42 hours. So that's not even two full days. You you might say that Jesus was in the grave for 1.8 days, and you're telling me that he was in there for three days. You see, the Bible contradicts, contradicts itself. But this is just the mere natural consequence of, of language. Language is often imprecise. I mean, we do this all the time. I mean, have you ever asked someone how old they are? You, hey, hey, how old are you? And they say, I'm 30. And then you say, you're a liar. <laughs> what do you mean? I looked it up. You're 30 years old, two months and six days. <laughs> well, no, no. Language is imprecise. Or you're at the store and someone says, hey, uh, do you got any money on you? Do you have any money? Oh, no, I, I, I don't have any money. Liar. I know you've got money in your bank account. Well, no, no. We meant it in like the physical way. Do I, so we, we, it, this is the way language works. Now, I could do this with my time here at this church. So, for example, 
I've been the, the teaching elder in this role at this church for five years and five months. So I could say I've been here for five years, but I could also say I've been here for seven years. Well, how can you do that? Easy. Because I started at the end of 2018 in this role, so I could say 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. I've been here over seven years. There are seven different years that I've been here, but the total length of time was five years and five months. So when it is referred to Jesus being in the grave, this is just normal, imprecise language. He died on a Friday, and he was in the grave Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's three days, but over that three days, it was probably about 42 hours. So no contradiction there. Nice try. It's, it's, just, it's just language. Now, moving on from that, Cleopas continues his summary. He tells Jesus that there were some women who came to the tomb on Sunday morning, and they found it empty, and furthermore, some angels claimed that Jesus was still alive. Now, I like how Cleopas um, summarizes this. He closes his summary in verse 24. He says, but him they did not see. We saw the tomb. There's rumors of angels, but we haven't seen Jesus himself. And this is so ironic because Cleopas is lamenting the fact that no one has seen a risen Savior, and yet as he offers this lament to this stranger, it is the risen Savior himself who stands before him. So I imagine kind of some chuckling as we read through the story. Now I want to consider Jesus' interpretation of Scripture in verse 27. This is when Jesus steps in with a rebuke and goes on to teach them as they are walking down the road. Now, one might ask, well, why are these two guys going to listen to a random stranger? Well, that's true, but we've all met people at a coffee shop or an airport at a social gathering who, in a very short amount of time, revealed themselves to be a very competent or knowledgeable person. And in fact, in verse 32, the testimony of those two men was that as Jesus, this veiled Jesus, spoke, their hearts were burning inside of them. Just as they were kept from seeing him, they were enthralled by what he said. And so this was, first and foremost, not just a mere exchange of words. This was a spiritual experience. Now, notice what Jesus taught. From Moses to the prophets, he goes on to interpret it for them, that all of this points forward. The entirety of the Old Testament points forward to a Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And this is why we as Christians, we include the Old Testament as part of Scripture. It is Scripture because it talks about Jesus pointing forward. Now, I always thought about this, this would be an amazing conversation to be a part of. And I always thought if I had a time machine, I would love to go back in time and hear that conversation, a four-hour walk where Jesus is explaining the Old Testament. And in fact, it reminds me of a scene from Back to the Future where they're trying to figure out where, where, where can we go in the past. Come here. I'll show you how it works. All right. First, you turn the time circuits on. This readout tells you where you're going, this one tells you where you are, this one tells you where you were. You input your destination time on this keypad. Say you want to see the sign of the Declaration of Independence. Or witness the birth of Christ. No, 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 no. If you have the time machine, don't go see the birth of Christ. I mean, that's cool, but there's no new information there. Like, it would be nice to see it. If you get the DeLorean, go back to this time and hear this conversation. This is what I'm going to do, okay? If I get a hold of DeLorean, I hit the 88 miles per hour with 1.21 gigawatts. I'm going to hide the DeLorean off to the side of the road. I'm going to throw some, some garb on, and I'm going to have a bunch of stuff like recording equipment because I don't speak Aramaic. So I'm going to have all this recording equipment, and as Jesus is walking along the road with these two guys, I'm going to shuffle in and be like, hi, and I'm just going to kind of stand there, and I'm going to record the entire conversation, and then I'm going to go back and then have someone translate it for me and figure out what the heck Jesus was talking about. I want to know what he said. And yet, if this is Jesus, a post-resurrected Jesus, I wonder if he would know who I was. <laughs> and I wonder when I show up if he's not going to look at me like this. Whoa, 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 what are you doing here, buddy? Or maybe he would be slightly perturbed 
and the look that I get might be this one. <laughs> so what was Jesus teaching them? Well, in verse 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And my guess is that he started with Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter in the entire Bible, we find a reference to the Messiah, that the offspring of Eve is going to crush the serpent's head. And then we could move forward and, and, and think about the lambs that they would sacrifice, and the lambs, when they were slain, would forgive sin. Or we could talk about the bronze snake that was lifted up in the desert. We could look at the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. We could uh, talk about Psalm 23, where Jesus cried out that that passage on the cross, or even go to the book of Hosea, uh, talked about being three days in the grave. So I imagine Jesus going from, from Genesis all the way to Hosea, pointing forward about the future that this Messiah would one day appear. Now, after some time, they completed this seven-mile walk, and they arrived at Emmaus, and they invited Jesus to stay with them, which he did, and it says in verse 31, that as Jesus broke the bread, that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Now again, notice the passive voice. Their eyes were opened. The same force or power that kept them from seeing him in the first place now opened their eyes. That at last they saw who he was. And what happens next is even more amazing because in verse 31, before their very eyes that have been opened, he disappears. He's just taken out of there. Now, I, surely there's some good Star Trek joke or analogy here, but I couldn't think of any. He was basically beamed up or something. So he vanishes before their eyes, and what do they do? They're so pumped. They've just made this seven-mile journey. They get back up, and they power walk the seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles what happened. Now, I like in verse 34 how they end this little narrative. Upon returning... They say to each other, the Lord has risen indeed. So if we're asking the question, what do we do with such a story? How do we apply it? We said at the beginning that we must grow in our faith by, by being properly calibrated, by making sure that we're plumb, making sure that we're flush, making sure that we're square with the Lord in our spiritual disciplines and in our faith, and what we must be open to spiritual correction. And so we see three things in the story of the road to Emmaus. The first one that we should consider is calibration through prayer. And I know this sounds kind of generic, but let me explain. You see, I hate to say it, but we aren't a particularly bright group of fallen creatures. We need help to see and to understand. And we find this concept throughout all of Scripture. And here's what I mean. This story is, is one that is about spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. The men were kept from seeing what they needed to see, and they were only allowed to see it when the Lord did something. They had nothing to do with it. It was all a work of God. And so what we have to do as Christians is that we have to pray and connect with the Lord and ask Him to give us sight. Now, we find this. There's many verses. Here's just three of them. Psalm 119. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. You see, we can have the law of God. We can have the word of God right in front of us and be reading it and be totally blind and missing it. So the psalmist says, Lord, before I read the scripture, I want you to open my eyes. We find this later in the book of Luke, and we'll tackle this next week. Then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scripture. You think we're going to understand the scripture on our own? No. No, we're not. We're naturally blind, even Christians. Here's another one, Revelation 3.18. The Lord says to this church, I counsel to you, I counsel you to buy from me, and then he goes on to say, solve to anoint your eyes that you may see. There are dozens of passages advocating this concept that we are, even Christians, all of us blind and need supernatural power to see. And there are two very specific things that we should do to apply this, and we ought to do it regularly. And the first one is to pray for ourselves. Here are two followers of Jesus that couldn't even recognize him when he was right in front of them. And so how much blindness would they have when Jesus was away from them? And how blind are we? How blind are we to our own faults, 
to our own sin? In what areas of our lives have we been deceived and we don't even know it? Someone will say, well, no, I'm not deceived. I would know if I was deceived. No, the very, at the very core of deceit is that you don't know that you're deceived. How blind are we in the way that we might be hurting other people or ourselves? And we can't even articulate this because we're so unaware. And so our prayer must begin with a sense of humility. It must begin with the confession where we come before the Lord's throne and we say, Lord, I, might, I, I don't think I am, but I could be totally off here. Maybe I'm, doing, maybe I'm just way off in this area of my life. Maybe I'm hurting people. Maybe I'm hurting you. Maybe I'm hurting the kingdom. And so we want to have a tightly calibrated, a plumb, a square walk with God, then a standard practice is that we must come before him and ask for a supernatural act of God in our lives to help us to see. And this, of course, leads us in prayer for others. And by the way, I wouldn't recommend praying for others in this way until we've done it first for ourselves. Of course, we all know people that we can see they are deceived, we can see that they're wrong, but we must lead by example and take the, take the plank out of our own eyes. You see, this is why we often run into interpersonal brick walls when we relate with people. You have that friend that won't even consider the claims of the gospel. They, they, you explain to them, like, no, no, sorry. You have a coworker who has a clear cognitive dissonance. What you're saying contradicts something that you just said? Or what about family members who are self-destructing? And you can lay out all the consequences, you can show them, but they won't listen to reason. Why? Because it's not enough to use our words. We have people in our lives who can't see what they're doing, they don't know what harm they're causing, and they don't know the contradictions under which they are functioning. This can only be beaten or undone by a supernatural work of the Lord. Remember that our battle, Paul says, is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting people, we're fighting rulers and powers and authorities of this present darkness. You can't win by your ingenious arguments. I wish I could. But this is a spiritual battle, and until we treat it as such, we will always lose because we are not wrestling with people alone. And no matter how bad people are, they are merely conduits of another battle. We focus on fighting with people instead of focusing on what's influencing people to act out the way they act. And so to the extent that we learn to fight spiritually will be the extent to which we have victory physically. Now, I don't mean to say that people shouldn't be confronted or that we shouldn't use our words. What I'm saying is that we are powerless to influence anyone unless it involves the mighty hand of the Lord and that we are praying for them. And so remember, friends, that everything physical is caused, provoked, or influenced by something spiritual. Remember that in the beginning, there was God and there was no time, matter, or space so we have something that is purely spiritual, and this spiritual uh, being created time, matter, and space. And so it is the spiritual that affects the physical. So rather than fighting the physical, let's do our battle in the spiritual realm, and maybe that will make the changes for us. We should calibrate our walk with the Lord through prayer so that we can see and that we can help others to see. Now, the next thing is we must calibrate through uncommon knowledge. In our story, when the veiled Jesus asked the two travelers, hey guys, you know, what are you guys talking about? What happened? And what the two travelers gave back to Jesus was what we might call prevailing knowledge or common knowledge. And what was that? Well, yeah, this Jesus guy, he was, he was a prophet. He was mighty in word. He was mighty in deed. But you know, they were wrong. The prevailing wisdom of the day, the common knowledge, was wrong. Jesus even went to his disciples one time, and this was fairly early on. He said, hey, guys, what is, what is the crowd saying? If you, if you go out there in the marketplace, who do they say I am? Well, you might be Elijah. You might be John the Baptist. Basically, everyone said, you're some kind of prophet. And then Jesus looked at Peter, and he said, okay, Peter, I want you to tell me who I am. And Peter says, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. And if you remember how the story goes, Jesus himself says, no, you didn't figure this out. This was revealed to you. The Lord did something in your heart that helped you to see. You see, Christians 
We can't calibrate our walk with God unless we audit what we think and what we believe. And we can only do this by comparing what we think and believe to the scripture itself. You see, what Christians typically do is we, we live in this culture and this world around us and we get our knowledge of God by what we hear, what our parents said, what our pastor said, what this guy's podcast said or, or, or social media memes. And that may or may not be actually true. So these men walking down the road, they knew some things, but their knowledge was incomplete, their knowledge was wrong, and they didn't get it until they spoke with Jesus himself. So how do we find this uncommon knowledge? How do we get access to the raw information that is unbounded by popular thought? Well, it's simple, it's commonplace, and you've heard it a million times before. We calibrate our walk with God, we make ourselves plumb before God by reading the scripture for ourselves. And this is a call for us to return to the source. And we must return to the very words of the Lord and not to rely so heavily on what others say or what others even teach. And let me share with you some things that are not a source of truth. Preaching from this pulpit is not a source of truth. The Bible study you attend is not a source of truth. The podcast you listen to, the Christian movie you saw, what you were taught, those are not sources of truth. Then you might say, well, why are we here in the first place listening to you yammer on? Because the preaching at your church or in your Bible study that you attend is only as good as how much it points to the actual scripture. So the preaching is of no value unless the preaching is based upon the word of God. Then you're getting the raw data, but it is not the person, the personality, or the program. It's the scripture. So if you want to up your game, if you want to calibrate your soul, if you want to be plumb, if you want to be right with the Lord, then we've got to move on to advanced mode and start reading the scripture for ourselves. We have to take responsibility to do it. Now, here's the final thing is calibration through proper interpretation. Look what Jesus said in verse 27, or rather what Luke says. It says that he, Jesus, interpreted to them. Jesus had an interpretation of the Scripture. Some might ask, well, do we even need to interpret the Scripture? And the answer is yes. Yes, we do. Consider these statements. This is Luke again. He says he, Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. I like this. That, that would be a good description. If you're a Bible study teacher, this is how you want to be described. You know, you teach about Jesus accurately. But this verse tells us that if someone can speak about Jesus accurately, then it means another person can speak about Jesus inaccurately. Here's another one. This is Paul teaching Timothy. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Once again, if you can rightly handle it, then you can poorly handle it. Friends, there's a fallacy that is floating around Christendom, another one of those uh, prevailing thoughts that, well, you know, you can't really know the scripture. Everyone has their own interpretation. No, 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 that's, that's false. Interpretation is not a code word for I get to make the text mean whatever I want. That's not an interpretation. That's a manipulation. Don't confuse those two. There is such a thing as a logical, reasonable, consistent, biblical interpretation of Scripture. Now, let me share with you the top two rules of interpreting that will help you read the Bible for yourself. Now, I know that if you go into the Bible bookstore or get online, there's going to be all kinds of books on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation, and it is complex. But here are two very, very simple things that we can do. The first one is that as we're reading the Bible, we should employ a plain or literal reading of the text. What is the average person who just opens up this story and reads it what are they going to come away with? They called it a, a plain or literal reading. 
So, for instance, if I'm in the middle of the Bible and it's an historical narrative, it's not, it's not symbolism, it's not poetry, it's just a regular story. This guy did this, this guy did this, they went here, this happened, and then suddenly there's a donkey talking. How does that work? Well, we often proceed from an anti-supernatural bias. We say, well, we know donkeys don't talk because I'm an expert in, in, uh, in equine linguistics and I know that just doesn't happen. I mean, yeah, you could give Mr. Ed the peanut butter. It's going to look like he's talking, but it, it's, it's not actually going to happen. But we've just made an interpretation. We, we've said that couldn't have happened because of my anti-supernatural bias. And so we say, well, that's, that's just silly. That's, that's a symbol. But if you look at the text, the text doesn't seem to explain it that way. The other thing that we can do is that we can use the Scripture to interpret itself. So if we're reading along and Jesus says something about faith, and we're wondering, wow, this was a hard comment that he made about faith. I wonder what he meant. Well, then I should look at the book of Hebrews, and I should look at this book and that book, and I should look all around the Scripture and use those other verses to help interpret this difficult statement that Jesus said on this particular topic. Now, I know it's more complicated than this, but this is going to get you 90% of the way there. Employ a plain or literal reading and use Scripture to interpret itself. So Jesus is walking down the road, and he's interpreting the Scripture for them that the entire breadth of the Old Testament points forward to this Messiah. And so we can become calibrated in our creed by using proper interpretation. Now, speaking of retaining walls or, or rather decks and building stuff, sometimes it can be frustrated. And maybe you want to move on to this. But it reminds me of, uh, you know, when I was learning to shoot, uh, I, I'm, I'm not law enforcement or military, so I had to, to learn it on my own. And it can be very complicated because you have the ballistic coefficient of, of the bullet, that's the shape of the bullet, then you have the weight of the bullet, and then you have the amount of powder that's in the gun, and when you shoot it, you know that the bullet's going to do, it's going to follow this trajectory. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that you have to do. Well, if you're shooting at a target, and maybe you're right on as far as elevation, but you're slightly off on your wind, so maybe you're to the left a little bit. And maybe I'm only to the left a quarter of an inch. So I shot my three shots, I made a little triangle, and I put the dot there, and I'm right on target as far as elevation, but I'm slightly off to the left, only a quarter of an inch, of an inch not a big deal. Well, guess what happens if I'm off at a quarter of an inch at 100 yards? What happens at 200 yards? Well, that quarter of an inch just grew bigger. And at 300 yards, it gets bigger. And at 400 yards, it doesn't matter because I can't shoot that far. <laughs> but the point is, is that one little error gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. It's the same way with that stupid deck I was rebuilding. You know, the, the frame was, was not square. It was not plumb. And everything I did, it just got worse and worse and worse. So we're turning the mirror on ourselves and we're asking, what can I do to be proper, ca properly calibrated to what the Lord has for my life? And so if you are a Christian here today, it is our response to this passage to turn the mirror on ourselves and to think about spiritual blindness and to think about how we're, are we trying to argue our way with people or are we going to just pray our way with people? Are we going to try to figure things out on our own or are we going to pray that the Lord reveals the truth to us? And how are we, how are we with our knowledge of God? Are we relying upon, well, this is what everyone says, so I'm going to believe it, or are we going to actually read the scripture for ourselves? And how are we interpreting this? So these are things that we can do to calibrate ourselves to make us more like Jesus himself. But if you are on the outside of the faith and you haven't made a decision yet, this is new to you, that's okay. We're glad that you're here. But please understand that what we know from the scripture is that all of us are separated from God naturally. That we are born into a broken world and we will always choose to rebel against the Lord's holiness. And as a result, we are separated from our creator. We're out of a relationship with him. There's no chance of us seeing anything. So what Jesus did is he sent his son to die on the cross. And on that cross, he paid the price for the sin of the world. So that when I call upon the Lord in faith, I can be forgiven. I can enter into a right relationship with my creator. And then he will begin to work in my life spiritually so that I will begin to see and to discern what he has for my life. And that will be a new and eternal life. So the good news of this story is that we don't have to stay where we are. God has something for us to give us an abundant life if we would but trust in him.